Flow cytometry and facts. Flow cytometry is a technique by which light is used to count and characterize cells in a heterogeneous population. This is a powerful tool used in technology employed for cell counting, cell sorting, biomarker detection, and more. While you may have heard the term flow cytometry be used interchangeably with BACS, these are not completely the same. BACS, or fluorescence activated cell sorting, is a type of flow cytometry in which the cells in the sample are physically sorted into different groups after analysis. In order to perform flow cytometry, there must be an appropriate sample. This sample must be made up of single cells and not attached to one another, so that individual cellular analysis can be performed. In the case where the sample is a tissue, this must be disrupted into individual cells. Furthermore, incubation with fluorescent probes can be used to identify cells with certain markers or characteristics. For example, a particular cell surface protein can be detected by using a fluorescent antibody. The overall flow cytometry analyzer is made up of a fluidic system, optics, electronics, and sorting in the case of facts. The fluidic system introduces the cells to the process. In order to obtain individual cellular information, we need to be able to illuminate each cell individually. This is managed by the fluidic system. The fluidic system is made up of a central core through which sample fluid is injected. This is enclosed by an outer sheath fluid. Both of these fluids are pushed through the system at slightly different pressures. Since the sheath fluid is under a higher pressure, it moves faster, creating a drag effect which will cause the sample in the central core to narrow. This process is called hydrodynamic focusing and results ultimately in a single line of particles. Without hydrodynamic focusing, the nozzle of the instrument would become blocked with cells. The optics involves the light applied to the sample, as well as a combination of mirrors and detectors. When the laser reaches each cell at what is called the interrogation point, the light is scattered and fluorescence is also emitted in the presence of fluorophores. Forward scattering, as the name implies, refers to scattering of light in the direction of the initial light path. This is collected by a forward scatter detector and is indicative of cell size. A stronger forward scatter signal corresponds with a larger cell size. Light is not only scattered forward by the cell, but in all directions by both the cell as well as its components. This side scatter is picked up by a side scatter detector. Side scattering signal is used to describe the granularity or complexity of a cell. Highly granular cells with a large amount of internal complexity, such as neutrophils, will produce more side-scattered light than less complex cells. Light can also trigger a fluorescence image if a cell is either naturally fluorescent or has been tagged with fluorescent molecules. There are a range of mirrors and detectors that collect this light, convert it to electrical pulses, and then take it to a computer to be analyzed. A system of filters ensures that each photo detector receives the appropriate wavelengths of light. The electronic system converts photons to photoelectrons and converts this analog signal to a digital one. The interaction of the laser beam with the cell is described as a voltage. When the laser and cell approach each other, the voltage starts to increase. As the cell is completely immersed in the laser, the voltage is at a peak, and once the cell starts to leave the path, the voltage decreases once again. These voltage pulses occur not only for cells, but also for any particular debris that pass through the laser. In order to avoid interference from any debris, we need to have a signal threshold. Signals below the threshold are not processed. However, one must be careful because if the signal threshold is too low, we'll have extra noise added into our signal. But if the signal threshold is too high, we might miss the cells of interest. If using facts, a sorting step is also involved in the process. Cell sorting is determined by parameters that the user decides. Based on the measured fluorescent intensity, an electrical charge will be applied to each cell. Electromagnets will then guide the cells based on this applied charge to the appropriate fraction. Overall in this process, the user is able to control cell sorting conditions as well as fluorescent markers that are tagged. They can also determine the signal threshold as well as the sheath and sample flow. Measured intensity values will provide us with information on size and cell complexity. With the use of a fluorescent probe, we can increase the amount of parameters that's available to include certain cell populations or certain types of receptors that are on a cell. In summary, the process starts with a single cell suspension that is passed through a narrow channel one at a time. 
Laser light illuminates individual cells in the channel, and scattered light, as well as fluorescent emission, is picked up by the detectors. These detectors, in turn, convert this information to a digital signal. The signal can then be analyzed by the user. Additionally, information from the signal can be combined with user-defined parameters to sort cells. Bax uses electrodes to impose an electrical signal on each cell. After exiting the flow chamber, electromagnets will sort the cells based on their charge. Data from flow cytometers can be visualized in multiple ways. In this histogram, we can see the intensity of the green or red fluorescence it is plotted on the x-axis. The number of cells with each level of fluorescence is plotted on the y-axis. In this example, there are twice as many cells sorted as green or unlabeled cells, but the, high, but the level of light was greater from the green cells than the red cells, as, in, as indicated by the uh, graph in the intensity part. Histograms aren't always the best way to visualize data, with multiple labels on a population. That's when we use dot plots or contour plots. In this diagram, we see a certain cell population tagged with PIT-C, where we get the cell count, and the blue graph gives us the negative control of this very experiment. With the dot plot, we see a different way to display the same data. The x-axis plots the intensity of green fluorescence, while the y-axis plots the intensity of red fluorescence. The individual black dots represent individual cells or counts, and we can look at the relative density of dots in each quarter. From this graph, you can see there are no cells labeled both red and green, that is the top right corner of the graph, and many cells that were unlabeled bottom left. In this diagram, we see a signal with side scattering versus the forward scattering for the distribution of blood. These are lymphocytes, granulocytes, and monocytes, which are not relevant here, but we can see them better in the next figure. Contour plot gives us a more resourceful look at the relative intensity in the sample. In this plot, the region in dark red is the most concentrated response, while the region in blue is the least concentrated. Contour plots can also be useful if there are more than two labels on a part of a cell population. However, it is impossible to visualize the correlations in multi-parameter data, perhaps consisting of as many as 12 fluorescences measured on each cell. We have to adopt a different strategy. We use what we call regions or gates. This figure has the same results as the one in the dot plot experiments, but here we can see it better with the concentration of every particle, as in the light gray has the highest concentration of cell particles, whereas the dark regions have the least concentration of particles. Sometimes we can also get them uh, distributed in the gates, which we'll talk about them in the next slide. The data generated by flow cytometers can be plotted in one or two dimensions to produce a histogram or scatter plot. The regions on these plots can be sequentially separated based on fluorescence intensity by creating a series of subset extractions termed gates. These gates can be produced using software. Figure B shows the gates with granulocytes, monocytes, and lymphocytes. Granulocytes cause a high side scattering response based on their complexity, while lymphocytes have lowest response for forward as well as side scattering due to their small size and low granularity. Figure C divides a population of monocytes wherein we can see that classical monocytes dominate the population. So flow cytometry and facts can be used for functional analysis, viability, cell cycle analysis, necrosis, apoptosis, phenotyping, surface as well as intracellular antigens, enzymatic activity, oxidative burst amongst others. Some of the immunological uses here are immunohematology, leukemia and lymphoma, phenotyping, hematopoietic progenitor cell enumeration, reticulocyte enumeration, and anti and antineutrophil antibodies. Some other immunological uses are to distinguish cell populations as well as T cell proliferation. The quantification of chemokine and cytokine receptors can relate the numbers of re receptors per cell, percentage of cells with each type of receptor, direct expansion of antigen-specific T cells, and sort either of these. The engineering aspects related to flow cytometry and facts are related to hydrodynamic focusing where we can change the shear rates as well as the sample flow rates to get the perfect diameter for a single cell line. And the signal processing related to electronic systems gives us the detector which converts light to electrical signals based on a few parameters. Electronics quantify the electric pulse by calculating the height, area, and the width. The height and area are maximum and integral respectively are used to measure signal intensity because their magnitudes are proportional to the number of photons that interact it. The width, on the other hand, is proportional to the time that the particle spent in the laser.
can be used to distinguish doublets from singlets. Another aspect is the log versus the linear scaling. Log amplification is normally used for fluorescence studies because it expands weak signals and compresses strong signals, resulting in a distribution that is easy to display on a histogram. The linear scaling is required when very small differences in fluorescence signal must be assessed, for example, in DNA analysis. Here you can see the difference in the graphs clearly, as you can see the lymphocytes, monocytes, and granulocytes clearly differentiated in the li linear part with the lower signal. 